This will be the twelfth class in the series addressing the four divinely mandated rituals of the ecclesial age. We are currently addressing the memorial component of the wine. We're told that memorial wine serves as a shadow projection of the blood of our Messiah, as well as the blood of the covenant. So we made the association with how the issue of blood specifically identifies four different categories of animals distinguished on the basis of their blood. These were first the blood-based offerings where eight categories of domesticated animals were offered in or near the tabernacle and could be used for no other purpose whatsoever. Second were the dietary uh, dietarily clean wild animals whose blood had to be poured into the dust and covered with dust. Third was the wild unclean animals whose blood was completely inconsequential to God as nothing was done with the blood of those forbidden uh, animals. Fourth are the prophetic prophetically symbolic animals projecting the immortalized Christ and the saints. These are the four bloodless cherubim and the four living creatures, as we're told specifically that blood cannot be part of the immortal spirit nature. So there are four categories of animals presented in scripture distinguished on the basis of blood. Four. Well, that makes sense. Four is the number of God manifestation, foundationally demonstrated in the four letters of the name of God, Y-H-W-H, or yod heh vav heh and the four salvation events identified in the Creator's plan, the salvation of Jesus Christ, the salvation of the first set of saints at the beginning, beginning of the millennial kingdom, the salvation of the second set of saints, saints in the eighth millennium since creation, after the conclusion of the kingdom, and then the salvation of God's entire creation project with the complete elimination of death in all of creation. Therefore, therefore, it should be highly consequential that there are four animal categories scripturally distinguished on the basis of blood, which defines our memorial wine. And we reviewed the first animal category as being those eight sacrificial animals whose blood was exclusively identified with the altar and the tabernacle. These were, there were significant consequences for non-compliance in the blood handling and the sacrificial offering. The second category of clean animals, those animals with the parted hooves, cloven hooves, and uh, chewed the cud, but were wild and not domestic, domesticated their blood was never welcome at the altar, despite the distinction that they did not jeopardize the physical holiness standards that God demanded. The blood of these clean but wild animals had to be poured into the dust and covered with dust, but the flesh of these clean but wild animals could be divinely acceptable part of the diet of the enlightened community. The third <coughs> category Animal category was also larger than the previous group. The largest group was the unclean animals whose blood was absolutely meaningless. There was no blood law that applied to these unclean beasts, meaning their lives, which the blood represented, were meaningless to God. The fourth um, scriptural animal category is actually bloodless. There is no blood in these spiritual animals, as the cherubim of Ezekiel and the four living creatures of Revelation and the seraphim described in Isaiah 6 are shadow projections of the immortalized Christ and the saints. And we know that blood is not a component of the immortal spirit nature that we hope to inherit, as we're clearly told by Paul that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We've identified those eight sacrificial animals as representing those acceptable to God within the enlightened community. We've identified the third blood category under the laws of the first kingdom of God, those unclean beasts representing the unenlightened community whose blood was meaningless. Therefore, their lives are not meaningful to God 
uh, from an eternal perspective. These people are not accountable to the judgment of Jesus Christ and die forever when their bodies expire. Now let's identify that second category of clean animals, the ones who were divinely clean but their blood was forbidden at the altar. Their blood had to be buried in the dust of the earth, and blood is God's symbol for life, and the blood is the focus of the immemorial wine. We read in Leviticus 17 in the context of the laws of the kingdom of God, And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. The blood, the life of these clean animals, was bound to the dust of the earth, and therefore the curse of the dust of the earth. In Genesis 3 and 19 we read, In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread, till you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And in Genesis 3 and 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. This is why we see the use of dust and ashes in the context of divine judgments throughout Scripture, such as how the aromatic dust of the four incense ingredients are transfigured into that single cloud that embraces the glory of God above the mercy seat in that first ritual on every day of atonement in the most holy chamber that saves the life of the high priest. The blood of these wild but divinely clean animals was bound to the curse of the dust. This category of clean animals is a shadow projection of all those within the enlightened community who will be required to attend the judgment seat of the Son of God, but will be rejected. These are the ones Jesus repeatedly warns will be weeping and gnashing their teeth at, the, at his judgment. These are the five lazy attend uh, wedding attendants, the lazy servant who hid the one talent he had been given to invest, and the goats in the three judgment parables in Matthew 25. The fact that there are far more clean animals whose blood is unacceptable at the Christ altar or burnt offering than the few that were acceptable is testimony of how Jesus warns us more than once that many are going to be called to the judgment of Christ but only a few of those called to the judgment will actually be chosen by him. This was exactly the warning of Jesus at the conclusion of two separate judgment parables. The parable of the kingdom uh, about all the laborers that received the same payment concluded with this very warning of Jesus in relation to the judgment, Matthew 20 and 16. So the last shall be first and the first last, but many will be called, but few chosen. Jesus also concludes the parable of the wedding of the king's son, when a man without a wedding garment is ejected from the wedding. In Matthew 22, picking up at verse 14, And he saith unto, them, unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. It is truly mystifying to see how brethren in our community degrade this serious warning of Jesus into a glorious confirmation of themselves, suggesting that they and we have actually been chosen by God for enlightenment. They violently rip this concluding phrase out of its judgment parable context and invert it into a self-worshipping confirmation of their own personal glory. In doing so, they actually declare God to be a liar and a hypocrite. 
because God has stated clearly that he would prefer all men, 100%, to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. Therefore, if he was to actually pick and choose certain people for enlightenment, then God has lied about wanting all men to come to the truth and acted hypocritically by only choosing a very few for enlightenment. That is impossible. That self-worshipping corruption of these warnings from Jesus Christ are quite insulting to God. In 1 Timothy 2, we read very clearly, uh, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God clearly states he would prefer that all men come to a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, he cannot possibly have a policy for indiscriminately choosing particular people for enlightenment. That would be hypocritical. And the first rule of understanding divine testimony is that God is always right. What should, what we should understand is that just because God does prefer all people to be enlightened, he isn't going to make that enlightenment easy. The primary divine goal in the development of the saints is not quantity, as often and rather oddly presumed by a great many in our community. The primary divine goal is quality, not quantity. This is why God testifies to us exclusively through a filter of intentional complexity. Only those with a circumcised heart within our community will even begin to see the hidden beauty and glory and the absolute seamless perfection and the infinite depth of our Creator's testimony and His righteousness. Historically, there has always, without exception, been a very few within the enlightened community represented by those few clean sacrificial animals whose blood, that symbol of mortal life, was acceptable at the Christ altar of burnt offering. And that blood was brought into the divine sanctuary to be spattered onto the veil and smeared on the incense altar horns and then brought to the um, uh, as also as well as being brought on the Day of Atonement into the Most Holy Chamber to be spattered east and west across a mercy seat. Those sacrificial animals and their blood do not exclusively represent Christ, but also those who are truly in Christ, and that involves more than simply being baptized. It's fairly easy to confirm this understanding that, therefore, the clean but wild beasts whose blood had to be poured out into the dust and covered with dust, that these clean animals represent the larger segment of the enlightened community that will be rejected at Christ's judgment. There are endless examples of how it has always been very few that have been saved in every single point of divine judgment for the enlightened community. Uh, only eight out of easily hundreds of millions of Christadelphians were saved on Noah's Ark. There's no record of any doctrinal apostasy whatsoever before the flood, only a behavioral apostasy. All those that drowned qualified as the enlightened, therefore the Christadelphians of that generation. Similarly, it was only two brethren in the entire enlightened community that exited Egypt and then were allowed to enter the Promised Land 40 years later, with over 600,000 other Christadelphian brethren being divinely condemned to die in the wilderness without inheriting the kingdom due to their beast-like instincts to flee in fear and not willingly and faithfully trust in God to care for and protect them as they would inherit the promised land. This was the pattern at Sodom when the necessarily hundreds of brothers and sisters in Lot's community that had separated themselves from Abram's group were divinely incinerated at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The same pattern is demonstrated in how only a few with the enlightened covenant-bound community responded to that cryptic warning of Jesus in the Olivet Prophecy, warning them to escape Jerusalem when they saw it surrounded by the enemy, 
well, those very few from within the much larger and enlightened covenant-bound community were spared from the divinely orchestrated judgment of the Roman Empire, the, the, their army in 70, the year 70 of the Common Era, the Spatian's army had surrounded Jerusalem late in the year 69 of the Common Era, giving it, um, giving the signal to the faithful that Jesus had identified to leave and not come back, as the city was surrounded, just like Jesus warned. But Vespasian's army conveniently pulled away from Jerusalem when they heard Emperor Nero was dead. Vespasian planned to be the next emperor, and he left for Rome, where he was actually appointed as the emperor of the Roman Empire by the Senate. But in the following spring, that same Roman army, led by General Titus, the son of Vespasian, returned to Jerusalem at Passover. Interestingly, exactly 40 years to the day when Jesus was chosen as the national Passover lamb on the 10th of Nisan, to those shouts of Hosanna, son of David, meaning save us now, son of David. Over a million of those covenant-bound, enlightened community, therefore the Christadelphians of that generation, were killed or enslaved in that destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. This destruction of Jerusalem is what Jesus prophesied in that same parable of the wedding of the king's son we referenced in Matthew 20, 22, when he concluded with that warning that many are going to be called, but only a few of those many called to the judgment are going to be chosen for that wedding of the king's son. We read this in um, Matthew 22. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come again he sent forth other servants saying tell them which are bidden behold i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage but they made light of it and went their ways one to his farm another to his merchandise and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them but when the king heard thereof he was wroth and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. The many who died or were enslaved had certainly been invited to the wedding of, the king, of God's son, but they refused. God judged these clean but wild beasts, identifying their blood with the curse of the dust. Dust thou art, and to dust you shall return. This is the same blood that is identified with the wine of our memorial service ritual. This is always the divine pattern, all through scripture. Only a few of the enlightened community will be chosen to become saints at Christ's judgment in the exact same pattern as the rest of scripture. And this is one of the lessons of the blood that many will be called to the judgment, but only a few will be chosen. The same lesson is demonstrated within the wine component of the memorial service ritual. So, we have these three animal categories distinguished on the basis of their blood. First is the blood of those eight sacrificial animals appointed by God, representing Christ and the saints. Second is the clean but wild animals whose blood was never permitted at the altar, but whose blood had to be poured into the dust and covered by dust, shadow projecting the many within the enlightened community who qualify as being cleansed, but will not be chosen by Christ at his judgment. The third category was the vast amount of unclean animals whose blood was completely insignificant and inconsequential shadow projecting the many unenlightened who perish forever when their bodies expire, never rising for Christ's judgment. As we have noted, there is actually a fourth animal category that is symbolically presented in scripture, but the blood distinction is that there's no blood whatsoever in this life category. There is nothing done with the blood, as there is no blood in these symbol symbolic creatures. These are the cherubim and the four living creatures in John's vision of the kingdom. And 
and the seraphim. There is no blood, as these represent the immortalized Christ and the saints. And since flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, therefore there has to be a distinct absence of blood in these intentionally complex shadow extensions of the immortalized substance of Christ and the saints. The blood handling for each animal category perfectly matches the animal holiness distinctions which identify the degree of divine acceptability. What should be so troubling is that the two clean animal categories clearly represent the entire enlightened community, the, the ecclesia for the last, last 6,000 years. The reason this should be so troubling is this contradicts the dominant impression that the huge majority of Christadelphians will be acceptable to Christ at the judgment. And the odd presumption that well, salvation is easy and close to guaranteed for Christadelphians. The divine precedent and the divine perspective is that only a very small percentage of clean animals were divinely acceptable at that Christ altar. These were the domesticated service animals, as opposed to the clean animals that were wild, but still qualified as clean and did not challenge God's physical holiness standards. This testifies to the understanding that most of the enlightened community will not be divinely acceptable at the point of divine judgment validating this quality observation is how the dramatically even larger number of unclean animals whose blood or, or life was completely meaningless perfectly matches the dramatically larger quantity of the global unenlightened community whose lives are completely meaningless from a divine perspective. Um, when Jesus comes again he will judge the enlightened community. There is no universal resurrection and judgment. There are qualifiers for the resurrection to mortality prior to judgment. There has to be an accountability to our Creator's righteousness that demands divine vindication to prompt that first of the two resurrections, that resurrection to judgment that precedes the resurrection to immortality. These two very different blood handling procedures for the animal categories that God defined as legitimate diet options project the two categories of the enlightened community. First, the saints, and two, those within the enlightened community who will not be invited to inherit the kingdom. The memorial wine is part of a number of related shadow principles that are that all blend together perfectly, but only when we get everything right. So, our next question is, why is wine used and not grape juice? Well, first of all, we're not commanded to particularly use wine in the memorial service. No direct command, but then again, there was no direct command to particularly use unleavened bread. Of course, we have an absolute mountain of evidence declaring the exclusive appropriateness of the necessarily unleavened bread that Jesus used to institute the ecclesial age ritual of memorial service. The Gospels refer to the beverage that follows the con consumption of the broken unleavened bread as simply the cup. Therefore, this is a very legitimate question. Why should we use wine? Why not water? or milk, or, or sheep's milk for that matter, or grape juice. And of course, grape juice is sometimes used as a non-alcoholic option in the memorial service at some ecclesias. Are we wise to respect those insisting that we are free to use any beverage that pours into a cup? Since there's no extremely simple direct command to particularly use wine. Well, our question about the appropriateness of wine for the second memorial component will have to consider that always necessary three-dimensional examination. This beverage in the cup represents the blood of Christ that has purchased us with our voluntary consent. The contents of that memorial cup constitute 
the validating and cleansing blood of the new covenant. It is in fact that cleansing blood represented by the memorial wine or the cup that affords our access to forgiveness. We read this in 1 John uh, 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this blood, seen in the memorial cup, represents the path of our redemption. And interestingly, additionally, our cleansing. It doesn't say forgives us for all sins. It says cleanses us from all sin. Cleansing and forgiveness are very different issues within the laws and rituals of the first kingdom of God. We also read in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. We are given access to what is most holy, like that most holy chamber, that third holiness stage in the tabernacle design, by the blood and the broken flesh of Christ, the very memorial symbols of the broken bread and the wine. Let's just read that in Hebrews 10, picking up at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, to bold, uh, uh, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So there we have the, the flesh and the blood of Christ that provides that access to the holiest. Those are the two components of the bread and the wine. The temple veil also represented the flesh of Christ, just like the memorial bread. That temple veil was ripped in two immediately upon the death of Jesus. That same temple veil upon which the blood of the sin offering was spattered seven times by the high priest in the sin offering procedure for the high priest and for the nation. By that blood of Jesus seen in the memorial cup, we are permitted to enter the holiest of all. So, Obviously, the particular liquid content of that memorial cup has to be not only very significant, but also has to fit harmoniously into that full three-dimensional range of the two witnesses of our Creator's righteousness, that written word of God being the Bible and the spoken word of God being creation. What we will find is that there is complementary creational evidence binding the significance of using particularly unleavened bread as well as wine for the performance of these two originally demonstrated memorial service ritual components. First, let's look at the historical use of wine in the various stages of our Heavenly Father's education of the enlightened community as we did with the bread. So in the patriarchal age, um, we read how Melchizedek, the king priest of Jerusalem, met Abram after the slaughter of the five kings that had captured his, his nephew Lot and, and the hundreds of Christadelphians that were, that were with him. Uh, that high priest of God, probably Shem, the son of Noah, uh, gave him bread and wine. Jesus is identified, of course, as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek in both Psalm 110 and Hebrews 7. Just as Melchizedek gave Abram bread and wine, so Jesus, our high priest, gives us, uh, being the spiritual descendants of Abraham, bread and wine in the memorial service. Also in the patriarchal age, we have Joseph, interpreting the bread and wine dreams for Pharaoh's baker of breads and his wine steward, basically the wine taster, who would be ensuring that Pharaoh was not being poisoned by wine. The baker of breads would die in three days, while Pharaoh's wine steward, who served his cup, would be ra saved and raised to the right hand of power, also in three days. These bread and wine symbols are consistent with the shadow frame of the bread and wine memorials, death and resurrection. 
we come to the First Kingdom Age. We've often referenced the bronze Christ altar of burnt offering in the courtyard of the tabernacle. That bronze altar is repeatedly defined by the Apostle Paul as directly representing Jesus Christ. Jesus is the heavenly substance casting the earthly shadow of the bronze altar of burnt offering. There were six altar offerings within two separate offering categories, including four blood-based animal offerings, the burnt, the peace, the sin, and trespass, and two bloodless, agriculturally sourced offerings, which would be the bread and the wine. These are the meal offering and the drink or wine offering. These two bloodless, agriculturally sourced offerings are the only two altar offerings that successfully transitioned into the ecclesial age rituals. Uh, through the bread and wine memorials instituted at Passover by Jesus. Just as the bread and wine offerings were identified with that Christ altar of burnt offering, so are the memorial bread and wine identified with our Messiah. The wine offering was extremely unique uh, out of these six, as this was the only offering that was not offered independently. Um, This seems to have prompted some Bible teachers Uh, to have unfortunately suggested that there were not six, but only five altar offerings, since the wine was not an independent offering, but only accompanied the burnt offering and the peace offering. But, but of course, never the sin or trespass offerings. But that's a completely incorrect presumption, due to the fact that God himself defines the wine as an offering. As, of, as opposed to, say, the oil that also accompanied altar uh, uh, offering categories, but was never defined as an offering by God, the wine certainly qualified as that highly appropriate sixth altar offering category because God identified the wine as an offering, and God is always right. One of the fascinating issues about this wine offering is how it catapults from its limited application during the First Kingdom Age uh, to its highly prominent significance during the Ecclesial Age. The wine goes from being an add-on component to other altar offerings to front and center in the weekly memorial service and represents the blood of our Savior that binds us to God in a covenant relationship and is defined as the blood of the covenant by which we are saved. Jesus, Jesus also warns the enlightened community that unless they drink his blood, uh, represented as the memorial wine, then they cannot inherit eternal life. So we need to understand this dramatic expansion of significance for the wine between the first kingdom age and the ecclesial age. So we should avoid dismissing the foundation lessons of the wine and blood uh, that are presented in the laws and rituals of the first kingdom of God. That would be unwise. Therefore, the fact that the bread and the wine altar offerings were both divinely required to accompany the burnt offering should be highly significant, as this was not the case with the sin or trespass blood offerings. As we noted in previous class, the behavioral response that God wanted us to see from the lesson of the burnt offering is the pursuit of the knowledge of God. Uh, This is spelled out perfectly clearly in Hosea 6. Despite this clarity, this is almost never the interpretation by teachers in the enlightened community who simplify, oversimplify this burnt offering category as representing a general sense of dedicated service to God as opposed to God's specific identification as representing the pursuit of the knowledge of God. Hosea 6 and 6, God says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Again, the Hebrew word translated sacrifice here is zabak, which is overwhelmingly and almost, almost exclusively associated with the peace offering. The Hebrew word translated mercy here is kesed, which is primarily translated as kindness and loving kindness, as well as mercy. The behavioral response God expected from the peace offering was loving kindness and mercy, or at least a mercy springing from love as opposed to mercy generated by mere empathy 
or even mercy prompted by bribery or social influence. But the behavioral response God expected from the burnt offering, the daily burnt offering, began in, and ended every day's activities for the priests was the pursuit of the knowledge of God. Not merely some general sense of dedication, but a specific category of dedication, the knowledge of God. So that bronze altar, the divinely appointed shadow of our Messiah, was identified as the altar of burnt offering. Not the altar of peace offering or the altar of the sin offering, but specifically the altar of burnt offering, from which God expected a response of a dedicated pursuit of the knowledge of himself. This burnt offering was the altar offering category that always included the bread and the wine offerings, just as the memorial ritual of the ecclesial age, with unleavened bread and wine being representatively identified with our Messiah seen in that shadow of the altar. The consistency between the bread and wine ritual of the first kingdom age and the bread and wine ritual of the ecclesial age is, is undeniable. No leavened bread was ever permitted by God to be offered on the altar or with the blood of God's offerings. The wine drink offering was required with the unleavened bread offering in the context of the burnt offering in relation to that first harvest feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that so perfectly projects that first divine harvest, the, the projecting both the immortalization of our Savior, as well as also shadow prophesying of that fourth and final salvation stage, which will be the complete elimination of death in all of God's creation. So we read in Leviticus 23 and verse 9, this combination of the bread and the wine in relation to that uh, feast. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits to your harvest, of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf of an a uh, uh, sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat, well, actually it should be wrench, translated grain, the grain offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. And this uh, also in Numbers 15. Verse 7, for a drink offering, you shall offer the third part of an hen of wine for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Clearly, the foundational precedent for the memorial cup was wine and not some other beverage or just an unfermented grape juice. So, we should ask the same always significant question, why? Why specifically wine? Is there some sort of complementary creational evidence that will validate the appropriateness of using particularly wine in the memorial cup? Well, perhaps we can answer that question in the context of how wine is made. When the skin of a harvested grape is pierced, the fermenting process begins. This is why grapes are crushed. This is why wine is referred to as the blood of the grape just like the beverage in the memorial cup. It's the, the crushing of the grapes, the piercing of the skin that presents that blood association. And this is the same picture as when the side of Jesus was pierced by the spear with blood and water issuing from his corpse. It is this piercing of the grape skin that gives the wild yeast on the skin the necessary access to the sugars within the skin. That yeast feeds on the sugars in the heart of the grape, which creates two byproducts. These are alcohol and carbon dioxide. It should be interesting to note that these, those two components will be close to equal with about 50% of the yeast consumption of the natural or added sugars being uh, converted into alcohol and about 50% being converted into CO2. Well, just as there are two products in the yeast sugar blending, 
there are also two stages in wine production. The first is just a few days long in the initial fermentation stage when about 70% of the fermentation occurs. The fermenting wine will not be air sealed. This allows the carbon dioxide to be eliminated, being released into the atmosphere. If that CO2 is not eliminated, the wine will not be all that pleasant to the palate at all. The second fermenting stage takes a lot longer and does have to be air sealed or the wine quality will be unacceptable. Uh, unpalatable enzymes would be created in the fermenting process if the developing wine is not air sealed after that first stage of fermentation. But that continuing but slower expansion in the second stage is why Jesus points out why uh, why people uh, did not store new wine in old wineskins. Of course, they didn't have glass bottles during Christ's ministry. They stored beverages in processed animal skins. Uh, Jesus offers yet another of his many creational proofs of divine principles in this observation. Even after the developing wine is air sealed, there will still be some expansion and that would destroy the old wineskin or leather container that had no more capacity to expand. This is an observation about the maturing education policy of our Creator, where He changes laws and rituals and requirements in the development of the maturing bride for His Son over 6,000 years. Interestingly, the wine as well as the new cloth are offered as creational identifiers of this progressive knowledge and educational component of our Creator's plan, that there would be new changes in that education process that would not fit within the old educational framework, such as the laws, rituals, and priesthood of the ecclesial age that followed the divine educational stage of the first kingdom age. A couple of scriptural theme applications can be seen in these, in this, um, uh, these wine production observations. First is the doubled doubling demonstrated in the wine development. The two components are the natural yeast bacteria outside the skin that are introduced to the natural sugars within the skin when the skin is punctured, broken, crushed. Secondly, we see the two components produced by the yeast feeding on the sugars of the grape being alcohol and carbon dioxide that are pretty evenly produced. This is extremely common scriptural pattern of a doubled double. How many, how many times have we considered the significance of the number two in relation to divine testimony patterns? This is the number defining divine balance in relation to the principle of truth. This was the lesson of the cloven hoof and the cleaving lesson demonstrated so frequently in the context of salvation all through scripture, such as the breaking of the memorial bread, the tearing of the temple veil, the cleaving of the Red Sea, the cleaving of the three earthbound sacrificial animals in the heaven and earth covenant between God and Abram, the cleaving of the crucifixion rock at Rephidim that saved them from uh, dying of thirst, and the cleaving of the Jordan River in order to enter the promised land. The doubled doubling of the wine creational model reminds us of the two sets of cloven feet of the cherubim. Uh, that shadow representation of the immortalized Christ and the saints. Those two feet that are cloven hooves constitute the same doubled double pattern. This was the lesson concerning why it takes two to go from six to eight, which is the progression from mortality to immortality. It takes two by divine design. The other issue that should be recognized is the elimination of the carbon dioxide in that first stage of the wine development process. This is a direct link to the ex same exact divine truth related to the unleavened bread used in that first memorial service at Christ's last meal at Passover. As we've noted previously, carbon is the signature element representing our sin-cursed mortal nature. Um, carb carbon is number six on the chart of the elements, but is really creation identified by 666, six, six, 
which is the number of the Antichrist, we're told from Revelation 13, as there are six protons, six electrons, and six neutrons in every carbon atom. Ne uh, demonstrating that highly negative, from a spiritual perspective, 666 identification, which is here within a creational from a creational perspective. We also know that every form of life on Earth is scientifically defined as being carbon-based life forms, including uh, both the categories of animal and vegetable life. Now, we breathe in oxygen, which is O2, uh, representing the two promised immortalizations of the saints when mortal will be covered with immortality and will go from a f flesh nature to a spirit nature. But we do not exhale O2. We exhale CO2, carbon dioxide. We breathe in clean air, but our sin-cursed bodies breathe out what is unclean, just like the liquids and the solids needed for our continued survival that enter our bodies as clean and then exit as divinely unclean. The elimination of the carbon from our bodies in our exhaled breath, that, that carbon dioxide, is the same process that is demonstrated in the memorial service where unleavened bread and wine are used, that wine that exhaled the CO2 in its production process, just like our sin-cursed bodies, and that unleavened bread that never had the CO2 puffing up the dough before it was baked. Leavened bread is created by uh, introducing that yeast into the grain salt water combination that creates leavened bread. The yeast feeds on the sugars in the pulverized grain flour that creates carbon dioxide that puffs up the dough into the more that more palatable soft bread that we all love to eat. Unleavened bread that divinely mandated bread for Passover, where Jesus instituted the memorial service ritual for the ecclesial age, eliminates the carbon, that uh, CO2 component, just like the fermenting process of wine during the first of the two fermenting stages in the development of the wine. Leaven was never ever allowed to be associated directly with any divinely appointed ritual shadow of our Messiah with extreme consequences if this rule was disrespected and God commanded that leaven could never accompany the blood of his sacrifices and the wine is a symbol of that blood. The unclean exhalings of our sin-cursed bodies, that carbon dioxide, has to be eliminated from the two memorials representing our Messiah, the bread and the wine, to demonstrate that when Jesus died, he was completely leaven-free, without any transgressional sin, no guilt. I certainly suffered with his sin-cursed nature that prompts temptations, but absolutely no transgressional sins, no leaven. Therefore, there is a direct creational testimony validation to the application of wine as opposed to other memorial service liquids for that cup. And that corresponds to the First Kingdom Age testimony of wine being the drink offering for one of those two agriculturally sourced Christ altar offerings. So our next class will address the issue of why the memorial bread has to be broken and the salvation-related theme of cleaving. <laughs>